Welcome everyone. My name is Izzy. I work at the Lewiston Public Library and you are here for Living a Life Less Wasteful, a virtual program with Zero Waste Maine co-founder Jules Olson. We have Jules Olson, Olson here with us. Your name has a lot of S's in it. <laughs> um, and so they're going to be doing a presentation for us in just a moment. If you would like to ask any questions throughout the presentation, feel free to type them into the chat box here. Um, and then if you are on Facebook, feel free to just comment below and we will filter all questions um, into the Zoom. And with that, I will pass it off to Jules. Welcome. Well, thank you. And thank you so much for having me. And thank you all for coming. I look forward to some theoretical future date where we can all meet in person again. But in the interim, thank you for joining me on Zoom. Um, so I will go ahead and share my screen. So here we go. Share. And then make it big. OK, so um, just real quick to sort of um, just tell you what we're going to be doing uh, tonight. I'm going to go through a presentation that talks a little bit about how I got interested in zero waste. And then I share a whole bunch of tips and strategies for how to get started doing zero waste if you're not already doing it, or maybe some different ideas um, that you can add to your practice if you um, are currently doing zero wasty things. And then at the end, um, I like to leave a lot of time for discussion and questions. I find generally um, that folks who come to these presentations are already doing lots of really great zero waste stuff. And so it's a good opportunity to um, share what you're doing. Uh, a lot of um, the folks that are joining us are going to be folks for, who are from your own community. So you might have questions, they might have answers or vice versa. Um, so it's a really great time to share a little bit. So um, without any further ado, I guess we'll get started. So um, people are always curious about how, um, how I got into zero waste and what my zero waste looks like. So I wanna say right off the bat, like we are not one of those families who has like a little jar that we store our trash in all year. So I kind of think that we do like a practical zero waste, which means like there's a lot of compromises, which means that we're still making trash, but we're making so much less trash than we used to that it feels like an achievement, I think. And sometimes when I do start to get discouraged, I feel like we're still making trash. I think about how much we made and how far we've come. And what we're doing right now feels very easy and very sustainable and something that we can continue doing for a really long time. Um, so I will say that at the beginning, when I really started uh, getting into zero waste, everything seemed hard. Like I had to think about everything. And, and you might have this experience too, when you really start to try to reduce the total amount of trash that you're making, everything in our society is designed for you to throw things away. And so you're having to really completely think outside of that box and it can be a little exhausting. But once you do uh, figure things out, once you have systems in place, once you have your own strategies and um, have found ways that make things work for you, it does become much easier. So another question that often comes up is, isn't it expensive to do zero waste, like buying things that aren't in packages or buying things <clears throat> that are maybe more expensive because they're going to last for a lot longer, like it can seem expensive, but the, the truth of the matter is absolutely that I have saved money by doing zero waste. So I am doing less recreational shopping. When I am shopping, it's often um, secondhand versus like buying things new. Um, I do a lot of creative repurposing and repairing. Um, we don't have a garbage bill anymore because we no longer have a garbage service. Um, I bring my own lunch and coffee with me, um, all sorts of things like that. So <clears throat> for us, it has absolutely saved us money. Um, so I have some basic guidelines and these guidelines have changed over the years and they'll continue to change, but I think that this is a really great place to start from. Number one, don't let perfect be the enemy of good. So don't give up because you can't do it perfectly. I think the problem with the <clears throat> label zero waste is that it makes it sound like you have to be at zero or you're not doing it. But like, you know, something that might be might be more truthful, like significantly reduced waste doesn't have that same sort of sexy zero waste to it. So don't let that be a barrier for doing doing anything. It's OK that it's not perfect. Um, number two, 
lead by example, I always think honey is more effective than vinegar. So when you see other people and you see what they're doing, and especially when you know, you're at the beginning and you're like really gung ho and you really want to like convert other people. I always say, just, just show them what you're doing instead of maybe lecturing them or attacking them for the choices that they're doing. It's going to work a lot better if, um, if you just kind of show them what you're doing. Um, number three, have an open mind and keep exploring. So solutions that might seem preposterous right now, later on might seem like totally doable or, um, you know, just kind of like keep thinking like outside of the box and keep exploring and keep thinking about um, different solutions um, than what you're maybe doing right now. Number four, you don't have to buy your way into zero waste. Um, I think like if you're getting a lot of your zero waste inspiration from social media, it can all be very aspirational. Um, it can look very expensive and polished and like make you feel like you have to buy like a set of bamboo travel cutlery in order to be zero waste, but you already have silverware in your kitchen and that's gonna be just fine. You don't have to buy new stuff. And number five, maybe most importantly, it's a marathon, not a sprint. This is something that you're going to be trying to do in theory for the rest of your life. And so if you like burst out of the gate and you're gonna go for it a hundred percent and then you quickly become overwhelmed because again, everything in our society is designed to make you throw away stuff you're going to get overwhelmed and discouraged. But if you kind of like pace yourself and pick up new things and just sort of like keep growing and um, you know, you're making things a habit and then adding new things into it, it's going to be a lot easier to maintain that for the long haul. So um, use what you already have. You probably already have the solution. So, you know, I'm going to be talking about a lot of different um, tips and strategies, and you'll be coming up with a lot of your own too. But whenever you can, use what you already have instead of buying um, something new. And especially at the beginning when you might think like, oh, in order to do X zero waste thing, I need to acquire Y. Um, just look to see if you have it at home first. And then half the time when you think that there is something that you need to buy for it, you end up not needing it at all. And you can just use something that you have. Um, and then this last little part about like, do you really need to own that? Can you borrow it or rent it instead? So like maybe um, maybe you need a chainsaw like once every two, <laughs> two years, like maybe you don't need to own your own chainsaw because then you're having to purchase the chainsaw, you're having to maintain the chainsaw and you're only using it infrequently. So maybe you can rent that or borrow it from a neighbor. And there's lots of things that sort of fall into that category. And what you might need all the time might be very different than what I need all the time. So just kind of think about it for yourself. Um, so we're all familiar with the, the three R's, you know, reduce, reuse, recycle. But with zero waste, there's some extra R's. So number one, refuse. So like right out of the gate, just, just don't do it. Say no, don't acquire that thing. Don't allow that thing to come into your home. Um, you don't need that thing. So maybe you're at, um, uh, a restaurant and they give you paper napkins, but you can say, no thanks, I brought my own cloth napkin or whatever um, whatever that situation is. Um, a couple others that are on here are repair. So um, I'll talk about repairing more later, but a lot of the things that we have been um, sort of culturally taught that once something is worn out or broken that we just replace it, but often we can repair that item and continue to use it. Um, and then also on here is rot to compost. And I'll talk about compost a lot more later. Um, but I want this little arrow on here to move recycling to the bottom. Recycling in the way that we are currently doing recycling is not a great solution because we're sending so much into recycling that there isn't really a market for those materials that are waiting to be recycled. And so what that ends up doing is that makes um, all these recycling materials be essentially worthless or worse worse than worthless where they're just ending up going to the dump because there is no market for them. And so it's really disincentivizing um, recycling. So the, the less we can, the more we can divert away from recycling by doing other strategies, um, the better off our recycling programs are going to be. And we'll talk about that some more later too. 
So here we go. We're going to launch into uh, the tips and strategies ahead. And I just want to say once again, remember, this is a marathon, not a sprint. I don't expect you to start doing all of these, um, you know, right at the end of the presentation. You can sort of incorporate them in over time. You're probably already doing some of them. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and get started. So um, how to start? <clears throat> how do you start zero wasting, right? So do a trash can audit, examine all of the disposable in your life. So actually look in your trash can, like look in your trash, like what are the things that you are throwing away? So look at your trash cans all around your house, like look in your garage, look in your vehicles, look in your trash can at work, like figure out what are the things that you are throwing away? Because what you throw away is going to be different than what I throw away or what someone else throws away. And so you're going to want to see what is it that you yourself are throwing away the most of. And so get inspired, go after the really low hanging, easy fruit. So maybe you're using like K cups, like, so instead of using K cups to make your coffee, try like a French press um, or, or whatever that is, maybe it's uh, Kleenex. So instead of Kleenex, you swap to hankies. But whatever you're doing, something that's going to be like make a big difference in the volume of your trash is really going to inspire you and is going to make you encouraged to keep going and trying other stuff to get um, less and less trash. Um, so create a zero waste kit and keep it with you. So a zero waste kit is when you're going out into the world and you're taking items with you to help you reduce trash when you're out in the world. And so when I first started my zero waste kit, it was like pretty big. It was like big and bulky. And I kept leaving it in the car because it was too big and bulky to take with me. So then I never had it with me when I actually needed it. So I would say err on the side of like a fewer amount of things. And then you can add to it as you go along. But the greatest hits here for sure um, are like a napkin or a towel, like something that you can use to dry your hands with. Um, you know, when you're um, washing your hands out in the world, so you're not using paper towels. Um, you can use that same thing to wrap up your leftovers with. You can do all sorts of things with a, a single piece of fabric. It's kind of amazing. Um, maybe some silverware or a straw, if those are things that you use a lot. Um, a drinking vessel. My drinking vessel doubles as food storage. So I have a, um, a coffee mug that has like a screw on lid, like a thermos kind of. And so I also use that, um, you know, it's my, it's my coffee cup in the morning and then it becomes my water bottle over the course of the day. And sometimes it becomes like the thing that I put my compost in on the way home. So like my banana peels, all that kind of stuff. And then I compost it when I get home. So whatever it is that you're going to need, whatever you're going to use, keep that with you. Um, oh, and I always have some uh, reusable bags in my bag as well. And I use those all the time. Those are by far the things that I use the most. And so I'm not going to like harp on a lot of statistics over the course of this, because I feel like you can all find, you know, statistics. But I do think just sort of thinking about um, what we're doing in the aggregate and how much of a difference it makes, like if lots of people do it, you know, so like this um, plastic bag ban in Maine right now, like maybe just one person isn't acquiring a lot of plastic bags over the course of the year. But if everyone is, it's a ton of plastic bags, right? And so our individual choices add up when there's a lot of us. And so one of the questions that I get about zero waste is like, don't you ever get discouraged when like you're trying so hard, but you see other people like making different choices or like, what's even the point if like one individual is doing this, but then like corporations are producing an enormous amount of waste. And I just have to keep coming back to this idea of the aggregate. If all of us were making different choices, it's going to make a huge impact systemically. Um, household paper goods. So I feel like this is a really easy one to swap out that makes a really big difference in the amount of trash. So just volume wise, right? So like hankies instead of Kleenex, um, cloth napkins instead of paper napkins, um, rags and towels instead of paper towels. And so one question that's come up a couple times recently, which I thought was interesting because it hadn't come up previously, is people were wondering, um, you know, with the amount of water that goes into washing cloth items, does that, um, you know, sort of tip the balance for the disposable stuff that you're not washing? But I think it's really important to think about like the complete 
life lifetime of an item, right? It's not just like the time that it's spending with you. It's all of the production that came before it. And then it's all of the disposal at the end. And so if you think about just like a paper napkin, right? So that paper napkin was a treat that was harvested, that was turned into pulp. And then through a lot of like extremely toxic chemical processing was turned into a paper napkin that was then delivered to you that you will then use once and it'll probably go in your trash, not in your compost. And then it's going to go to a landfill where it will be forever breaking down anaerobically, right? Like without oxygen, which is then creating all sorts of like further chemical problems. So and it, versus like if you have a, um, a, a cotton, um, a cotton napkin, there's a lot of water, like cotton is super water, uh, water intensive, right? But then you have that item for like years and years and years, and you're using it thousands of times over the course of that life cycle. And then at the end, like when it's like just been worn to pieces, you can compost it. So I think, you know, it's never just an easy equation. You kind of end up having to think about things a lot. But I think, um, you know, by buying secondhand, by using things like for their duration of their life, and then by having like a plan in place for the end of their life cycle, what that's going to look like, it is absolutely um, a better a better solution to use a reusable item than a single use item. So jars of hankies everywhere. So I got this idea of just sort of replacing uh, Kleenex with um, jars of hankies all around the house from this book, um, Zero Waste Home by Bea Johnson. And it's funny because I remember reading this book um, years ago and thinking that it seemed aspirational and impossible and just very polished. And like, I was never, my life was never going to look like that. And while my home certainly does not look like Johnson's home, a lot of the, my choices are, and a lot of my strategies now look a lot like that, um, which is, I think, an interesting sort of, um, you know, when you think about something at the beginning of your journey, and then you think about it several years later, and all of a sudden, these things that seemed impossible now seem really doable and really easy. Um, so if I could recommend one book, I would recommend uh, Zero Waste Home. I really like this book. It has lots of really great ideas in it. Um, and the Jars of Hankies, totally from this book. Jars of Hankies are hands down one of my family's favorite outcomes of the zero waste changes. Um, cannot recommend those enough. And so our hankies are a mix of like actual hankies, like we bought like um, sort of old fashioned like cotton hankies. Oh look, I've got a jar of them right here. And then um, a lot of uh, repurposed t-shirts and other sorts of things that were kind of like fully at the end of their life. They weren't even like great for rags anymore. Um, and they became hankies instead. So food, I think is one of the hardest things to completely eliminate um, trash. Like food comes in so much packaging, like there'll be a box and inside the box is like a plastic bag. and attached to the box is like a clear panel. Like there's just so much packaging, right? Um, but at least with produce, you can generally get um, unpackaged produce. And as much as possible, just choose the unpackaged options. So if there's a bag of carrots and there's loose carrots, get the loose carrots, that kind of thing. Um, if you live in an area that has a place where you can buy from bulk bins, that's another great way um, to reduce your trash, especially if it's something <clears throat> that comes in very large packaging. So by sort of splitting that packaging amongst all the people who are purchasing from the bulk bins, you are definitely reducing the overall amount of um, trash that ends up going away. Um, so if you haven't used a bulk bin before, Depending on the store, they can be a little different, but generally in, um, in general, the way it works is that you bring your own containers. So sometimes I'll bring jars. I often have um, lots of cloth bags and I use those cloth bags for everything, for flour, cocoa powder, beans, like everything. Um, and I just use the jars for uh, liquid bulk stuff like honey or maple syrup or soap or whatever, olive oil. Um, but you take, you, you weigh the containers. So a lot of my bags have the weight already like written on them. So I have the weight always there, but you can weigh the jars. And so then you add what you're buying into your container 
And then when you go to weigh your total item, like say it's a jar of, um, of olive oil, you can tear out the weight of your jar. And so you're only paying for the, the cost of the volume of the item inside it. So I hope that makes sense. Um, and so there are places around Maine absolutely where there are not a lot of bulk bin options. Uh, if you don't have access to bulk bins, um, choose packaging that you're going to be able to compost or reuse, um, worst case scenario that you need to recycle it, um, or buy like the largest possible package of that thing. So instead of buying like a very small bag of rice, buy a larger bag of rice that you can store in the freezer and then just take what you need because the total amount of packaging on a large bag of rice is much less than multiple small bags. Um, and just real quickly, uh, black plastic is very difficult to recycle. So avoid black plastic if you can. Um, toiletries are super fun and easy. So a lot of them are um, really fun to DIY. So you can like make your own toothpaste, um, deodorant, all sorts of things like that. Um, but you can also get a lot of these things unpackaged or you can get them um, in reusable packaging. So even things um, <clears throat> like deodorant, you can now get those at Target in paper packaging or you can get unpackaged soap like right at the grocery store. So there's lots of options that are easy to get now. Um, it used to be very difficult to try to find um, things that were in recyclable or compostable packaging or unpackaged altogether, but I feel like the market is responding to consumers' interest in reducing their trash, which is a really great sign, right? Um, so a couple things on here that might uh, require a little bit of elaboration. So um, any kind of soap, whenever possible, get it in a solid form as opposed to a liquid form. So shampoo, conditioner, moisturizer, um, soap, toothpaste, all of these things can come in solid forms. So for example, I have a, um, a solid bar of shampoo and a solid bar of conditioner, and they're amazing, they work great. Um, you can get uh, toothpaste like tablets that you chew or like a powder that you dip your brush into. There's lots of options there instead of like the, the tube, the non-recyclable tube. Um, with toothbrushes, you can get um, bamboo toothbrushes, like what's shown in the picture here. And so then at the end of the life cycle, you can pull out the bristles with a plier and then you have to throw away the bristles. But the, um, but the handle, you can reuse it for something else, like maybe a sign in your garden for what kind of thing you're growing there, or you can compost it. Um, uh, let's see what else is here. Oh, shaving supplies. So you can get... Um, you know, like the old fashioned shaving soap and the shaving brush and uh, the shaving, um, the shaver itself, you can get um, a reusable one that just comes with uh, disposable blades. So it's just the blade that you're having to get rid of. Um, I have one of those, it's amazing. It's a safety razor, it's great. I bought like a hundred blades for it for 10 bucks. I will have that thing for the rest of my life. It's, it's awesome. Um, menstrual supplies, you can totally uh, make your period zero waste. There's, um, there's menstrual cups, there's reusable uh, pads, there's uh, period underwear, all sorts of really great options now. Um, bidet, this used to be sort of a thing that like <laughs> people would just laugh about, but <clears throat> now thanks to like the toilet paper crisis of the COVID pandemic, everyone wants a bidet. And so they are, they're inexpensive, they're easy to install um, and they're great. It can really reduce the amount of toilet paper that you need in your life. So repair and maintain, there's so many things, you know, that I mentioned previously that we're just in the mindset of like, oh, it's worn out, it's time to throw it out. But the more you can repair that item and extend its life, um, the less you're going to be contributing to trash, right? So there's lots of things that um, are intuitive to repair, like we repair our cars, right? But there's other things that might not be as intuitive to repair. Like there's a lot of things that have just sort of been lost over time. So um, shoe repair at a cobbler, we have a cobbler here in Augusta. Um, he is very familiar with all my shoes. Um, clothing, you know, find a seamstress, find a tailor, someone who can fix your clothes and adjust them so they fit you better. 
um, so that you'll want to continue to wear them for a really long time. Um, appliances, there's lots of small appliance repair shops out there. Um, you'd be surprised what they can fix. Um, furniture and toys, all sorts of things like that. I've gotten really interested in, um, in repairing. I love repairing stuff now. It's almost become like a hobby. I just go around fixing everything in my house and it's 100% because of zero waste. So I've actually, I was just earlier today, um, sort of going through my mending basket and you can see like I have a whole pile of stuff here but here's like I um I have pets and they destroy everything so here's I have like a million bandanas and you can see a little patch right here that I did today so I'm, I'm like always fixing everything and I feel like a one dollar bandana is something that you know in a previous life I might have said to myself like oh that's okay I can just get a new one but why would I get a new one if I can fix this and it's just as good? I bet you can barely even tell where the patch is <laughs> over the internet. Um, so yeah, so just sort of keep an open mind and like see what you can fix so that you can extend its life. Um, gift wrapping. So the holidays were absolutely um, like peak season for trash in our household. Like we always made a lot of trash anyways. It's like so embarrassing to even remember, but but around the holidays, our enormous trash can, we couldn't even fit all of our trash in our enormous trash can because we had so much trash. And a lot of that was gift wrapping and gift packaging. Um, so now we have hardly, there's like no change really in the amount of trash around our holidays because we do a lot of sort of repurposed um, or cloth gift wrapping. So on the left-hand side, so this is furoshiki gift wrapping, which is a Japanese technique for wrapping presents with, it's like a big square of fabric. And it looks really difficult to do this, but I'll tell you what, it's actually super easy. And everyone's always really impressed. And they always think that you did something very difficult. So if you want to impress someone with a beautifully wrapped package, may I recommend a large square of fabric? Uh, and there's lots of tutorials for how to do that on YouTube. And over on the right-hand side, so all year long, I collect random bits of things. Like I collect any brown paper or like brown paper bags that come my way. I collect pieces of string, pieces of ribbon, like, like a little magpie. And then when it comes time um, to wrap things at the end of the year, I bring all that out and I use a lot of that. Um, and then I sort of accompany it with like little trimmings from the Christmas tree, you know, like there's inevitably like those branches that you have to cut off. So like, I'll save some of those and like, um, you know, I'll dry some like apples or like, or apple slices. Like if you cut it sideways, so it makes the little star in the center or like cut shapes out of um, uh, orange rinds or like little pieces of cloves, anything like that. And just tie it all together. And it always looks so beautiful. Um, and of course, like less photogenically, uh, we also reuse a lot of gift bags and by reusing those gift bags, which we've had the same ones for years now, um, that makes a big difference too. Um, and so a lot of commercially available wrapping paper can't be recycled. Some of it can, but a lot of it has um, like glitter or um, like sizings on it so that it's not easily recyclable. So really consider, um, you know, finding ways to wrap gifts that don't create trash, but also think about the contents of those gifts too. Like, um, you know, what kind of packaging are they coming in? Is there something else that you could give? Maybe something that doesn't even need to be wrapped, like an experience, um, like uh, a gift certificate to a restaurant or um, whatever that is. Uh, but yeah, doesn't have to be an item. Doesn't have to be new. Cleaning. So <laughs> like, if you go to the cleaning department in a, in a store, it's like shocking how many aisles are dedicated to really specific cleaning supplies that are all probably really bad for your health. But I have found that soap, sun, vinegar, and baking soda are pretty much the cure for practically anything. Um, you can clean pretty much anything in your house with those four things. Um, but I've also realized recently that this is not necessarily common knowledge that people don't really know how to clean with these things. Um, so for example, uh, like cleaning glass, like instead of using Windex, which is like just super bad for you. Instead, you can use a mixture of vinegar and water. You can use old newspapers to 
wash it with like a cloth and then you can compost the newspapers or you can just use like um like a cloth washcloth and you wipe it with the same thing and it's like just as good better than uh, windex so that's just one example but there's a ton of examples um <clears throat> If you have questions about how to clean with these things, definitely bring it up at the end, or you can always email me um, through Zero Waste Me. Just go to the website. There's a contact us there. I can answer any of your questions that you think of um, as a result of this talk. So laundry, there's the obvious sort of trash that comes from laundry, right? Like the things that you actually throw away, like lint or dryer sheets or whatever. So, but there's also the, the, the trash that's created by your laundry that you can't even really see. So microplastics, which are like tiny little fragments of plastics that are shed off uh, synthetic fibers when they go through the laundry. So microplastics are a huge problem because plastic just breaks down into smaller and smaller pieces, right? And these microplastics um, are eaten and absorbed by wildlife, fish, creatures, and then it moves up the food chain, right? So first of all, when you're choosing clothing, if possible, choose something that's not made of synthetics. So synthetics are anything that's like um, uh, polyester, like anything that's like acrylic, and then nylon, anything like that, versus uh, natural fibers, which would be like cotton, wool, silk, linen, hemp, anything that's coming from a plant or an animal, um, viscose uh, can be a little like weird because it can technically be made of wood, but it's been through so much processing that, um, you know, that's not great either, but, but it's still a natural product, right? It's still something that's going to break down. So as it's going out into the water system, it's like, it is breaking down instead of just becoming smaller and smaller bits of plastic. Um, if you have a lot of synthetic clothes, uh, you don't have to get rid of all of them. You, there are lots of different solutions for how to trap those plastics. So there's, <clears throat> there's a product called a Guppy Friend, which is a bag that you put your synthetic clothing into to wash it and it captures the microplastics in theory um, so that it's not washing out into the water systems. Um, you can get compostable dryer sheets. Um, the Meyer brand, Meyer's brand dryer sheets are compostable, for example. Um, there's wool dryer balls. So it's, it's, my house is very dry and things get extremely staticky. So I have not found just dryer balls on their own to be a great solution. But for some people that does work well. Um, and then of course, uh, line drying, you can skip the drying entirely. Um, with brown tail moth, I feel like for half the year it's <clears throat> brown tail moth season and the other half of the year it's too cold <laughs> to dry stuff outside, but you can also line dry things inside too. So I have a couple of big wood like clothes horses that um, I dry things on. You can also just like put things on hangers and hang them up along your shower curtains. Whatever different solutions, just sort of think outside the box and think about how can I skip the dryer completely. And then finally, you can ask yourself, how often do I really need to wash this? Are you putting something into the laundry because you've worn it once and out of habit, you think it needs to be washed? Maybe it can be worn again, maybe several times. So compost, um, I am very into composting. Composting has become a hobby of mine. So I have different compost solutions because I have the ability to have lots of compost solutions where I, where I live but you should find whatever composting system works for you. So depending on where you live, you might have um, a municipal composting solution where you can put out buckets and they will come pick up your buckets. And if you want, they will return compost to you. Um, some places have um, like a municipal compost dump where you can go dump things uh, for compost. Um, I have sort of like in this picture, but not as cute, I have like a pallet, um, big composting system in my backyard. I mostly use that for um, uh, like yard waste, like le leaves and weeds and um, the shavings from my chicken coop, that kind of stuff. I also have like a tumbler. So if you have like a small space, the tumbler is really great. And the tumbler also like compost things really quickly because it's small and hot. Um, it gets really well aerated. And I also have, um, 
a worm composting tower. And my worms are mostly responsible for composting like the paper that inevitably comes into our house. So if we get pizza takeout, the worms compost um, our pizza boxes or like junk mail, that kind of stuff. I don't give them anything that's like has a lot of like plasticky, um, plasticky sizing on it, but anything that's, um, you know, like just like a regular paper, I give all that to my worms. And there's a lot of things that you can compost like outside of, you know, what you might think of as like food scraps, right? So um, when you're sweeping your house, you can compost all that stuff. Um, you can uh, <clears throat> compost like your pet's fur. Um, so anything that's a natural material, you can compost it. So if all of your laundry is also um, natural fibers, you can compost that lint as well too. So find what works for you, right? So not everything has worked for me. As much as I would love to, <laughs> to use like a homemade toothpaste or like a, um, like a toothy tabs or whatever, like I have very sensitive teeth and I want to die if I don't use like my super sensitive teeth toothpaste. So I use my super sensitive teeth toothpaste, right? So like, I am not perfect. Like there's a million things like that, right? So not everything will work for you. Not everything has worked for me. Like find the compromise that is going to, to work to make it so that you can continue to do things, right? And so also in my household, um, I'm into the zero waste stuff. My partner is not into the zero waste stuff. So we're always trying to kind of figure out like, where's that like middle ground <laughs> where like neither one of us feel like we're giving up too much. And so having a partner who's not into zero waste can definitely be a challenge. And that's come up before um, at these talks. So if you have any questions about that, I'm happy to answer that. Um, or at least I can say like what has worked for me. Um, so stay motivated uh, and keep trying to do more. So ask yourself, you know, why are you here? Like if you can articulate why it is you're interested in learning about zero waste or doing more zero waste stuff, it's going to, you're going to be able to like come back to that thought as you move through things. And as things get like maybe tricky, or maybe you feel like you've kind of fallen off the wagon a little bit, if you can remember what your original motivations were, um, that's going to be really helpful and find what keeps you inspired. So I really like books and documentaries, you know, as a librarian, that probably comes as no surprise, but I really find, um, you know, reading other people's, other people's books or blogs about what their experience has been or what they, what they do, or seeing documentaries about um, the harm that trash has on our planet. Like it can be a downer for sure, but it definitely inspires me. The same way that going to the dump and seeing just all the trash that my whole community is responsible for, like that also really inspires me. Because if I think about if all of us were even just like having the amount of trash that we make, like that would make an enormous difference, like a very tangible concrete difference. Um, find a community and get involved. So it doesn't have to be like a big community, right? Like maybe it's just one friend, like maybe you find one friend and the two of you are really interested in this. It's so helpful to be able to say like, what is it that you do to overcome this dumb problem that I'm having that I am like having to work so hard to solve, you know? Um, like I have, uh, of course, my friend Suzanne, who I founded, uh, co-founded Zero Waste Me with, she's like, we're such great sounding boards for each other. And we sort of talk about our solutions that we use. So even though our lifestyles are really different, like I live kind of in like a little suburb, you know, and she lives on a homestead in the country. Like we have very different lifestyles, but we're able to, um, to share some solutions, which has been great. Um, Yes, so I really recommend that. So even if it's an online community, like that's great too. Like maybe a Facebook group, like whatever it is that um, you can ask your questions and you can see what other people are doing and that kind of thing, it's going to be really helpful. And I will say just one last time, being less than perfect doesn't make you not be doing zero waste, right? Like you don't have to do it perfectly. Like you just have to do something. You know, there's this quote that keeps circulating around, um, uh, that's been attributed to uh, the Zero Waste Chef, which is a really great website. I would check that out for sure. 
which is that like, we don't need like one person doing zero waste perfectly. We need everyone doing zero waste imperfectly, um, which is just, just the best quote ever. Um, so don't stop at zero waste, right? So hold producers accountable. So consumers are just the tip of the iceberg in the amount of waste that gets created. Like the producers are absolutely um, the biggest producers of trash. And so by, by using your money to uh, support unpackaged products or um, locally made products or whatever that is, you're going to be telling the producers with your money what it is that you want and they're going to respond to that. So the same way that we're seeing like paper packaged deodorant at Target, unpackaged uh, soap at the grocery store, like that's because they're responding to consumer needs. So keep using your money to tell people what you want, but also hold the producers accountable. So um, the extended producer responsibility bill that was just passed in the Maine legislature is a really great example of that. Um, holding the producers of the trash responsible for their end stage uh, of their life cycle, right? So like they're paying, they're having to pay for the recycling. They're being incentivized to change the products, um, change their packaging into packaging that can be recycled or composted or eliminating the packaging entirely, that sort of thing. Um, to elect people who care and who will take action, people who will put forward bills like the extended producer responsibility bill and who will vote for that. Um, use consume fewer animal products. Animal products are, our animals are responsible, like the, the farmed animals are responsible for an enormous amount of deforestation, methane gas, uh, global warming, uh, uh, rainforest being cleared to produce grain to feed those animals. So the less, the fewer animal products you're consuming, the less you're contributing to that as well. Travel less, of course, um, and just support local everything. So I used to say support local agriculture, which is also great, but the more I have come along in my journey, the more I think that this is, this is all interconnected. So, you know, support your local library, support your local um, literacy learners, support local, everything like local businesses keep everything local because all of that is going to help create the infrastructure too to be able to make change and to be able to um, produce less waste so um, this is my website uh, zerowaste.me.org there's lots of really great um, information on there there's recommended resources um, if you're into documentaries or books i've got lots of good recommendations on there um, we've got some tutorials, for example, how to make your own beeswax wraps. Um, there's also this really great map you can see over here on the left hand side, which was created by um, Vanessa Berry of EcoMaine in a partnership with us. Um, and so you can go into that map, it's interactive, and you can see what retailers are near you um, and what sort of zero waste options um, they offer their shoppers. Um, and it's also an interactive map in the sense that you can submit suggestions. So if you know of another retailer that should be on the map who isn't, you can um, submit that suggestion and you can contact me. So if you have any questions, you can do that there. So I'm gonna stop sharing and then we can go to q and A. I I hope people have questions. <laughs> so um, unfortunately it looks like we do not have a chat box, I think. I might have made a mistake in setting this up. If you have questions, we can still do it on Zoom. Um, if you're on Zoom, I mean, you can raise your hand. There's a raise hand button towards the bottom of the screen. If you raise your hand for a question, I will click the button next to your name that allows you to talk and you can speak your question aloud. Um, sorry for anybody who's used to our programs and used to typing in their chat, um, typing in the chat for questions. It doesn't look like that's working right now. So just raise your hand and we will allow you to speak your question aloud. And then as for Facebook, we do already have one question. It's how do you keep produce fresh in the fridge in cotton bags? Oh, that is such a great question. So I don't store my produce in the fridge in the cotton bags. So I bring them home in the cotton bags and then depending on what it is, I put it in something else. And so I will say I store almost all my produce in glass jars and that seems to work amazing. So like, um, lettuce anything that's like greens like lettuces or herbs anything like that 
they go in a glass jar or also if I have a lot of lettuce, I have this like giant plastic thing that like, it's like a pork rind container. I don't even know where this came from, but it's like amazing and it's huge. Um, and so I store greens in that. So I really put everything in containers and that helps it um, store for a really long time. And then of course there's like some produce that you wouldn't put in the fridge like tomatoes or whatever. But for the most part, things go in containers and then go in the fridge. Good question. Yeah. Again, to all those in Zoom, I apologize. The chat feature isn't working. So you'll have to click the raise hand button at the bottom of the screen if you want to ask a question. We'll wait a few more minutes to see if anybody has any questions they can think of. I do think your point about doing it at least a little bit, not necessarily focusing on doing it perfectly is such a huge point because I, that's always what I get caught up on. Like I wanna be better, you know, and then I try to start doing something better, but here I am using a paper towel and a plastic bag and I <laughs> curse myself, like I'm, I'm done, you know? <laughs> this is yeah. yeah, like I really feel like, especially with something like this, you just can't think that way because, you know, like I've said already, like, everything in our culture is like trying to make you dispose of stuff, right? Like so yeah. much money is being made by you throwing stuff away. So just be gentle on yourself and, you know, do what you can and then add more things if you can. But if that is your baseline, like what you're doing right now, that's good. Yeah. All right. We have one hand. Let me see. Holly. Oh, yeah. So Holly, you can just unmute yourself to ask your question. Um, so this is David with Holly, but um, I just wanted to make a comment that might be um, a talking point with regard to hanging wash in the house. Mm -hmm. uh, sometimes there's an added benefit in winter of humidifying, which is probably sometimes needed as the house dries out when we're heating. So. Yeah. I also wanted to compliment you, Jules, that you probably keep your house cool because you have a nice sweater on and a hat to keep you warm. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I was actually oh, saying to awesome. Izzy right before this started, the heating is not working in the back half of my house. <laughs> so I'm like very bundled up in a very cold room. <laughs> <laughs> but it is one of those things we instinctively go to turn the furnace up rather than think about right putting on that extra layer so yeah for sure yeah absolutely thank you very interesting um presentation oh thank you thank you thank you holly and david we have another hand from patricia okay can you hear me sure yes. can um i want to know what about cat litter i, mm. I buy clay litter and i'm building up a hillside at our house but is that really okay? Is there bad stuff in it? Yes, I am so glad you asked that. So you like cat litter just needs to go to the landfill because there's, I can't remember what it's called. There's some um, super toxic bacteria that is temporarily escaping me right now in cat poo, which is very toxic to wildlife. So, you know, um, if it gets into the ocean, for example, like otters have died from it, like you really don't want that stuff to be loose in the environment. So I have cats, um, my cat litter just goes in the garbage. So in terms of like what cat litter you use, like clay litter is mostly come from like strip mining in the Appalachians. So I would not necessarily recommend clay litter if you can avoid it. Um, but there's lots of more sustainable stuff that's available, like the yesterday's news, which is made out of um, old newspapers. There's corn and wheat based litters. But at the end of the day, all that stuff just needs to go to the dump where it can be sealed up. Sadly. Wow, that's really shocking. <laughs> yeah, don't put it in your toilet. Don't put it outside. Just landfill that stuff for sure. Getting your cat to switch letters is now the tricky part. <laughs> well, that doesn't make a difference though, right? You said it, it doesn't matter what it is. It still has to go to the landfill. It still has to go to the landfill, but like how it's produced can make a difference, right? So like, it's not just about um, the life cycle of something like while it's 
in your hands or after, like there's a whole part of its life that exists before it came to you. So if you think about like wh where that stuff came from, if you think about like, you know, we're like in the Appalachians, they're literally blowing the tops off mountains and then excavating the clay there, like that kind of sucks. But maybe like reusing um, newspaper material or using like the byproducts of like corn and wheat agriculture, like at least it's being reused and it's not, you know, generating as much harm to the environment as the sourcing of the clay. Okay, that's something to think about. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, sorry, sorry to be such a downer. I know, you know, the cat thing has come up the last couple of times. I feel like I need to start incorporating that into the presentation. Yeah. A lot of cats in the library world. <laughs> yeah, we love cats, right? <laughs> All right, we have another question from Facebook, a couple of them. Um, how do you feel about recycled paper products such as seventh generation toilet paper? Yeah, I mean, I feel like whenever paper is coming from a recycled paper source, like that's an improvement for sure. You know, if you can eliminate the need for that paper product entirely, that's even better. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you're choosing between a paper product that's coming from like virgin wood material versus like post-consumer recycling, recycling is definitely better. Uh, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Do you just use bleach to wash your used jar of hankies? Uh, like the like the hankies themselves. Actually, the hankies just go in with our um, like towel laundry. So like our our towels, hankies, washcloths, um, all of those things are our only laundry that gets washed on hot, and then the dryer pretty much kills anything, anyways. So we put all those items in the dryer too. So we don't use bleach on those items. We just use regular laundry soap, wash it on hot and then put it in the dryer. What about the jar? How do you clean the jar to make, keep it sanitary after? Or do you only oh, put clean hankies in there? They only, yeah, they only, they only get clean hankies and then the dirty hankies just go in the laundry. Okay. Yeah. Thanks. Hopefully everyone's getting their questions answered and learning lots. I know I am. <laughs> um, we'll have a few more minutes. If there's any other questions, please either raise your hand in Zoom or comment in Facebook. I guess I have a question. How do you keep, you mentioned ways to keep yourself inspired, like going to the dumps and kind of seeing the impact yeah. we're making. Do you have like tried and true ways that are more uplifting to keep you motivated? You know, like uh, sometimes people just get so <laughs> overwhelmed. I know personally, like I have a degree in environmental science and it was, it was depressing, you know? And so I need inspiration that comes from, you know, optimism more than pessimism. I, you know, I'm just really bad at self-care categorically. So things that are like depressing are more, uh, more influential on me, I have to say. But I mean, I think, you know, like, like I was talking about, about finding a community, like finding someone else who's doing something. And like, you know, I've seen some um, documentaries that uh, like within the household, they made it look like fun, you know, like they turned things into like competitions with each other, like who could make the le least trash or whatever. Um, you know, so I think there are ways that you can make it fun sort of by egging, egging each other on. Um, I also like, cause I, um, I follow a whole bunch of zero wasters on, um, Instagram and some of them make like really great little videos. And even though it's, they're way more polished than my life will ever be in a million years, like still seeing, um, you know, seeing other people and seeing what they're doing and seeing what their, what their lives, what their zero waste lives look like. I think that's inspiring too. But like I said, for me, mostly it's just like the depressing documentaries, <laughs> like <laughs> the garbage at the dump. <laughs> 
(laughs) 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 And I really do. I feel like, you know, there has to be like a belief that like, maybe like what I'm doing makes no difference. Right. But like, if everyone was doing this, or even like, if a lot of people were doing this, it would genuinely make a big difference. Yeah. So, Which is why it's about. not about perfection. It's just about doing any little thing. Makes it yes, better. absolutely. Absolutely. Um, okay. A couple more Facebook questions. Could you please restate the name of the Japanese holiday wrapping technique? Yes, it is furoshiki wrapping. Furoshiki. And then what was the book that you recommended? Uh, Zero Waste Home by Bea Johnson. There's lots of great books, 100%. There's so many great books, but I really like that one. Yes, and I did already look that one up, and we do have it at the Lewiston Public Library. So you can go ahead and get your holds on that now. Great. (laughs) All right, we have some more questions here in Zoom. Uh, Let's see, first we have Tracy. Go ahead and unmute yourself, Tracy. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Okay. So I was just curious, is zero waste living kind of like green living? It almost sounds like the same thing. Yeah, totally. It's all falling under that same umbrella, right? I just think that the, probably the difference is, is that zero waste living is very focused on eliminating consumer trash. Like that's sort of like the the particular focus but yeah I mean there's oh, okay. you know and I and I think like it's not helpful to to only focus on that like you still have to sort of look at like the larger umbrella of like things that fall under green living so like yeah. maybe using your dryer isn't like producing trash per se but you know there's a greener way of approaching drying your laundry so I think it's helpful yeah, we- Look we only use the fluffer in the dryer. <laughs> we air dry <laughs> everything. <laughs> and I'm really, I'm really picking on dryers here, but you know, there's a lot of yeah. things that are kind of like that. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for sharing. I'm always looking for ways to be green and yeah. Stuff, so. Thank you. You're thank welcome. You, yeah. All right. We have another question from Carol. Go ahead and unmute yourself. What is there any um, data on the trade-off between burning things like in our wood stoves as a disposal method for things that that um, might or might not be composted, especially in the winter? Mm, I don't know. I mean, that's a good question. I would lean toward composting things because when you're burning something, you're releasing whatever that stuff is like up in smoke, right? Versus Particles like and carbon dioxide. Yeah. yeah. But like yeah. all the, all the, all the, um, you know, like depending on what it is that you're burning okay. too. Right. Whereas if like, if you're composting it at the end of its composting life cycle, you have soil that you can use just to put in a yard and grow things in, or even if you're not growing things, you can still just spread that soil. So I feel like on the whole, like if you can compost something at the end of its life cycle, that's probably the best, the best environmental solution. But I don't know. That's a great question. In terms, and I of use like- ma- I use junk mail, not not shiny junk mail, but you know, just paper mm-hmm. as as um to get the fire started and, and newspaper. Mm. Yeah, yeah, I use uh, yeah, I use newspaper to start my fire too, and right. I feel like it's like one of those things where like if you're going to start your fire anyways, like you might as well use something that is like repurposing something rather than using something new, obviously. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I never use new. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there, there are people out there who buy like fire starters, you know what I mean? So like- But you can I, make them from coffee grounds and things like that. Yeah, yeah. And nutshells. Mm-hmm. Dryer lint also makes a really great uh, fire starter too. So that's another there way. Was, <clears throat> there was an article in the New York Times this morning about, or maybe it was Washington Post, about dryer lint being um, bartered among neighborhoods for um, use as guinea pig bedding. <laughs> Sounds that's- disgusting to me because it usually stinks. But anyway, <laughs> I mean the dryer stuff stinks. You know if they put if they use dryer sheets. But anyway, uh-huh. yeah. Yeah, but I mean, that's great. I mean, I feel like anything that's just like repurposing something. So like at the end of its, what you would think of at the end of its life cycle 
if you're able to use it again for a whole new purpose, that's that's like the core of zero waste. Yep. Very good interesting. Question. Yeah, good question. Thank you, Carol. All right. We just have one minute left. Any final questions? Now is the time. <laughs> Oh, Carol had a follow up, maybe. Well, I just want is the recording. Are we going to get a link to the recording? Um, so the recording will be on Facebook. So if you go to facebook.com slash Lewiston library, you'll be able to see it there. And then in a couple days up to a week, it'll be on our YouTube channel. OK, that's great, because a lot of us don't use Facebook. Yeah, mm -hmm. you, you can still watch the videos on Facebook without having an account, just so you know. OK, I, but if I you don't want to touch sure. the site at all, I understand. <laughs> Exactly. Thank you very much. <laughs> I feel you, Carol. Sound with Facebook. <laughs> All right. Thank you so much, Jules. This has been amazing. Um, if you guys didn't catch earlier, zerowasteme.org is the website um, where you can find their contact info and lots of resources. Even just the website is inspiring to me, honestly. Um, <laughs> great work. All right. Thank you all for coming. And we are going to wrap up. Have a good night, everyone. Thank you so much, everybody. Good night.